Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at West 2018, the leading maritime conference and trade show on the west coast of the United States. It's co-sponsored by AFSIA International as well as the United States Naval Institute. And we have with us uh, part of uh, Lockheed Martin's uh, crack uh, laser uh, team. Ian McKinney is a PhD. Uh, you're uh, the, the lead on the laser and sensor uh, programs over at Lockheed Martin. And uh, Tim Fouts, who is the capture, uh, was the senior manager, capture manager uh, for the Helios uh, contract, which you guys uh, recently won, awarded six months uh, ahead of schedule, um, $150 million, but total uh, about almost a billion dollars in value for a, a Navy laser. Tim, let's start with you. How'd you guys manage to, you know, tell us a little bit about the program and what its objectives are, but also how you guys managed to get awards six months ahead of schedule. Well, first off, we are pleased that the Navy selected us. Uh, it was a tough competition along the way. We put together, uh, you know, talk about the world-class laser system. That is the foundation that we built around. But it's the overall suite of capabilities that Lockheed Martin was able to bring together across our enterprise. From uh, weapon systems engineers, shipside uh, maintenance, it was an entire package that uh, we offered the Navy, and we believe that's why uh, we were awarded ahead of schedule. Ian, tell us a little bit about the capabilities of the of the laser. The weapon system, in fact, is is what it is, uh, and its role aboard ship and the types of ships that it's uh, likely to be fitted aboard. Sure, yeah. So it builds on two uh, previous uh, key demonstrations. One on the Lockheed side, uh, we delivered last year a 60 kilowatt laser to the U.S. Army, which is going to be used in a ground vehicle and tested in the, on, uh, in the range against a variety of, of threats. But the maturity of that laser, I think, was, was a centerpiece uh, to, of our offering to the Navy. And then it, we're also building on the success the Navy has had in the past in putting a laser weapon system on the USS Ponce. And that's been out there for several years at this point. And the importance of that was that uh, the Navy put that into the hands of sailors. And so I think the whole community learned a lot about how a system can be used in the field on board a ship. And I think that informed, I would say, the whole community, uh, including the Navy and industry, about how effective a laser weapon system can be. And uh, that uh, laser, if I recall correctly, was Art Sabrowski at the Office of Force Transformation, is the one who'd originally underwritten the investment in that laser that is the one that eventually ended up uh, on, on Ponce. Um, what sort of a door does this open up, Tim, for other sorts of opportunities? You know, as, you, as, as the Navy and each of the military services look at the kind of challenges posed by, for example, a China that has an enormous amount of uh, missiles, all sorts of ranges from smallest to very, very long range. There are folks who are looking at this as traditional intercept technologies can get very expensive. Even though Lockheed Martin is in that business, everybody recognizes that directed energy is a better way to go in terms of shot per, you know, more, much more economical uh, exchange value. Talk to us a little bit about some of the other opportunities you guys are pursuing in order to be able to sort of expand these toeholds. Well, I think you mentioned that it's complementary and Kinetic weapons are probably still going to be there for the long term. These are in addition to, so as the threats advance, laser weapon systems and the additional technologies that we'll bring will continue to feed uh, the future fleet needs, capability upgrades along the way. Uh, the Navy's laid out a, a roadmap. Uh, if you haven't seen that, they've got increments laid out for Helios and surface laser weapons. This is the first one of, of three that they've identified at this point. So why we've got to deliver on this near term. They're already looking at what that next is for anti-ship cruise missiles and additional threats that continue to grow. So Ian, uh, you uh, mentioned before we got started, that this is the year of the laser uh, in, in many respects. Uh, but there are those who also look at lasers and, uh, and uh, you know, Steve O'Brien and I talked about this at Surface Navy not very long ago, this perception that, well, they'll be coming in another five years. They'll be coming in another five years. You've, you've devoted your life to studying them and perfecting uh, lasers, uh, including your PhD at Manchester University, which you got uh, in, in uh, laser engineering. Talk to us a little bit about why this time is different because you know time and again we've sort of seen whether it was with airborne laser or then with solid state lasers or the nautilus system or the tactical high energy laser that some of these systems have been somewhat less than what we had expected in many many respects out there as a as a fielded weapon system i think there's two major changes that have taken place that make me very confident that this time is going to be different it, it's certainly a, a very valid question uh, i would say the first development has been the a technological one so the advancement um, that we've made at Lockheed in terms of shrinking down 
the size and weight of the laser itself, which is, is a big driver of the size and weight of a laser weapon system, now means that these systems can fit on tactical platforms that the military currently uses, whether it be a DDG for the Navy, whether it be perhaps a striker platform for the Army, there's now no longer a need for a special platform to be built and developed just for the laser. So that's the first factor. Second one is the proliferation of a series of threats that the laser is ideally suited to address. As, as Tim mentioned, kinetic energy and, and directed energy are really complementary. And the piece that lasers address best is when you have a proliferation of inexpensive threats, such as uh, drones or such as uh, rockets and mortars. And inex the, uh, the inexpensive cost per kill of the laser then becomes a key in addition to the deep magazine. You can really keep firing as long as you have fuel to the laser weapon system. So given the proliferation of those threats, laser weapons really have a, a niche um, that they can really fulfill while also fitting on platforms that are currently in the military. I think it's those two things that have, have really uh, allowed us to turn the corner. And when you talk about fuel, um, you know, there was the coil laser, which was the um, chemical um, iodine laser. Uh, but you, you talk to us about what the fuel is, because as you transition to solid state laser technology, there's a perception that all you're doing is putting power into it. But talk to us a little bit about the fuel part of the equation. Sure. So uh, essentially, the, the, uh, it, these are what are, what are referred to as electrical lasers. So basically, we're, we're, uh, the fuel is allowing us to provide electrical power to the laser itself. So unlike the chemical lasers you mentioned, where they're really driven by a chemical reaction, in this case, uh, it's electrical power. And the efficiency of the laser that we provided to the Army that I mentioned last year is extremely high for a laser. There's been nothing demonstrated at high power at that level. It's north of 40%. It may not sound very much, but that's an improvement by a factor of two or so over previous electrical lasers. That means that the electrical power system can be dramatically reduced, as can the thermal system that deals with the waste heat that's generated. So both of those things have been key drivers in, in uh, shrinking down the size and weight of the system. Okay, so there was a slight misreading of the question on my part because I thought that you guys had injected some sort of the form of combustible in the system, whereas you're talking about fuel, the, the fuel actually to generate the power in order to drive this, the solid state right, laser. Right. Uh, but thank you very much for that answer and, and the, uh, the clarification. Let me ask you a little bit about atmospherics as well. At that um, layer, and one of the important uh, attributes of Ponce, but something that the Airborne Laser Program worked to resolve also was atmospheric distortion, uh, and that uh, layer on the sea surface is a very, very difficult layer, indeed, as it is for the Army with dust and everything that exists on that. Talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges of operating the laser in that sort of dense air, humid, fog, uh, where you have a lot of, or, or sand or dust particles that will give you a lot of refraction. Talk to us about how you guys have worked, whether it's through optics or other things, the, the beam management part of this problem to turn it into a reliable weapon system that you can use not just on you know sort of a sunny clear day that just doesn't happen to be humid for example so there are basically two challenges that uh, one has in that respect one is scattering from particles in the atmosphere whether it be sand or raindrops or whatever it is and the second one is thermal distortion so if you think of looking across a road surface on a hot day and how the uh the view that you have is distorted. Exactly the same thing happens to a laser. And you're quite right, it happens closest to the ground or closest to the surface of the water, far worse than anywhere else. So both of these missions are dealing with, uh, if you will, the hardest challenge from an atmospheric point of view. So how do we address that? Well, first of all, uh, our laser technology is based on fiber lasers. And incidentally, those leverage billion dollar investment by commercial industry in advancing fiber lasers. Fiber lasers inherently produce what we refer to as a very high beam quality. What that means is that the, this, these lasers provide the maximum power on target. So it's one thing to have power generated by the laser, it's another to make sure the highest fraction of that reaches the target and is effective. So if we start off with a very high beam quality that spreads out very little in the atmosphere, it's going to be, it's going to provide more power on target regardless of the atmosphere. So that's one element of it is to start with a very high quality beam to start with that simply doesn't spread as much and doesn't break up as much in the atmosphere. However, the atmosphere still has an effect. And to counter that, um, what we look at in general is a technique called adaptive optics, which measures the atmosphere, pre-compensates the laser, and then gets back to closer to the original uh, power of the laser at the target. So it certainly is a challenge. But starting with the highest quality beam you can and then measuring and compensating the atmosphere are the two key elements to addressing that. 
Uh, Tim, let me bring you back into it. So what's the next milestone in the Helios program? So we're or milestones, I should say. So we are just starting to get uh, into conversations with our customer. Um, we recently had our out brief, and the program's going to get up and running at the middle of this month. And uh, but you know, ballpark. When are you guys trying to shoot to at least have the first unit sort of out there and deployed, even in a ballpark stand, standpoint? One year, two years. Twenty 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 is right now uh, the target. If everything everything falls into place with the contract. Hopefully there's no more continuing resolutions. We're always always uh, watching out for that to keep everything running. And and how many units are covered under the uh, uh, contract as it currently stands? This first one is for the first two units, one that will go to a DDG, and the other one that will go to White Sands Missile Range for testing. And then eventually how many could be covered under this if all the clauses are exercised and you get to that billion dollar level? The total contract uh, was for 15 units and those are an option year, so the Navy could buy uh, as few as two and as many as five. Um, Ian, let me go back to you. Uh, as somebody who sort of sees this as the year of the laser, uh, you know, where do you see the technology? You, you talked about the billion dollar investment made by commercial industry. Uh, you, you jumped ahead on a question which I was going to ask you on that, but talk to us a little bit about where you think we're going to be in five years. And, and you know, uh, because you said that there have been so many encouraging developments, there's so much data that's feeding in, you guys are going to generate even more data as you go through the process of, of, of building this product. Talk to us a little bit about where you think it's going to be in five or ten years when it comes to this uh, technology, whether in terms of power levels or in terms of capability. So I think one of the key differences that's happened recently, in addition to the ones I mentioned uh, before, is the fact that um, programs of record are starting to be looked at seriously and program offices within the, the services are now engaged. So we're now talking about really transitioning this uh, capability to the warfighter. Uh, Tim talked about the Helios program as a great example of that transition. The Army also has an, an on-ramp to a program called IFPIC-2. If lasers are, are proven out well on Army programs, then there's also a path on the timeline you mentioned to transition them there. So I think we're really looking at getting systems out deployed on the timeline you've talked about. And so that's another important difference from the past. So, so that's one element, is, is really getting them into the hands of the warfighters. The other element you mentioned is, is power scaling. Some of the harder missions that lasers are going to be asked to address require power scaling. And the technology that we are bringing to bear is very modular and highly scalable. So uh, while current system we've delivered is at the 60 kilowatt level, there are really no physics barriers to scaling that to significantly higher power levels, many times that number, which will allow us to address some of these hardened threats in the future and on the, on the sort of time horizon that you mentioned. Gentlemen, thanks very much. Best of luck on the program. Fascinating conversation. And we'd love to keep talking to you guys about better and better and better lasers. Ian, thank you. Thank you. And Tim, thanks very thank much. Thank you so much.